Thank you so much for being here. It's so great to have a wonderful turnout, and I think it can only enrich the conversations that we plan on having today, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge some officials that we have in the room. Uh, may, we're very lucky to have Mayor John Stokes here today. And we... Also, City Manager Brad Miyaki is here. Deputy City Manager Nathan McCommon is here as well. And we're also very lucky to have Steve Kasner and Jerry Hughes from the East Bellevue Community Council. Can you please raise your hands, please, to acknowledge. Thank you. So throughout my life, you know, I've had a lot of great privileges and a lot of great um, life experiences. I was born in the Philippines. My father was in the military, so I lived in Japan, on a military base in Japan, in Guam. I worked on an international development program, uh, project in Cambodia. I've had the opportunity to take uh, young people and tr travel throughout the Far East. You know, my orientation, I can say, is, is fairly international in its scope and global, I think just like Bellevue, right? 99 different languages that are spoken, international partnerships that are happening, Xinhua University, University of Washington, Microsoft, they're putting together GIX, kind of an educational technology institute. Vibrant community fairs highlighting cultures, flavors of India. I think about, uh, we had our first Northwest Ukrainian festival uh, last year as well. So it's fantastic being part of an international and global community. I think we feel that anytime we walk outside the door. That in itself is great, but it also can be very limiting in our domestic discussion on race. For the other part of my life, I was working in South and West Seattle doing youth development and community service and community building. It was there that I started to understand our domestic relationship with race, which was very different than the conversations I was having internationally. It was at that time that I saw a correlation between old policies and practices and, it, and its impacts on today's communities. I became a student of history and sought information to help me make sense of it all and was shocked to see how deliberate race played a role in the development of our social systems. When you think about it, where you can go to school, who you can marry, who could vote, who could become a citizen, where you can live, all had a racial overlay. I worked with young people who were coming from segregated schools, although we didn't call them segregated schools, although they were 97% people of color, who were also challenged to, uh, who were challenged to be understood by society and struggled with issues of poverty. So what I've come to understand in the couple of decades in doing this work is we all look at issues of race a little differently. Some people think about it all the time, others rarely. And I think it's important to acknowledge kind of the international flavor that we have here in Bellevue, but also the domestic conversation that we need to have, because that's really what's dominating our headlines, and that's really what we're still trying to resolve. I've learned that we can all be pretty good listeners without actually hearing. I, sometimes I spend my time rebutting, you know, thinking about what's my rebuttal, right? Or thinking about this person is absolutely crazy, so I'm shutting down. So I think this is an opportunity for us to be able to express ourselves authentically, but I think more importantly, to be able to stop the judgment and the racing mind, to be able to truly listen. I think that's one of the gifts that we can provide each other today. We all have to be involved. This is another thing. We all have to be involved if we want to build that just and equitable society. And this is gonna require practice, practice, practice. Many of us don't have these opportunities to engage in these conversations. So we're very lucky to be able to have this opportunity today to do that. So I'd like to thank King County Library System and their staff for their sponsorship and support of our three-part Better Together series culminating with tonight's program. I'd like to thank Neighborhood Outreach, Mediation, and the Diversity Department for their help with tonight's program and throughout the series. I'd like to thank our facilitators, our lead facilitators, uh, Joe and Tizita, and all the folks who have come to volunteer to help facilitate. And a special thanks goes out to Ying Carlson and Gwen Russo 
for helping with IT needs for tonight's event. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mayor John Stokes. Well, I'm really, really pleased to be here tonight. Good evening to you. Uh, on behalf of the City Council, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you, and always glad to have you come down here. This is the community's uh, building, and it's always great to see uh, people from the community and getting everybody in, in here to come to these events and come down to meetings. We have meetings going on here all the time, and uh, that's, that's something I think is, is really special in, in Bellevue. Um, I'm really proud of the, this, our city for hosting this forum under our skin, what do we mean about race? I grew up uh, in a segregated society in Texas, outside of Houston. Uh, my grandparents uh, came from East Texas. I spent a lot of time there. Uh, East Texas is, is part of the South. Um, we had segregated schools. Um, fortunately, my parents knew uh, people of other races. And uh, what I can gather, apparently, I, I got a lot of um, good uh, support or, you know, um, viewpoints from my parents. But um, as I grew up and went to, to school, there were very few, if any, were well, the only uh, kids of any race were just very bare majority, uh, minority. And it was such a different world then. Um, skip fast to... Uh, law school in 1963 when I was in George Washington University in DC, which was kind of a different experience. And I happened to be there and, and went, uh, was really excited about going to a big event happening on uh, the, at the Washington Monument and Jefferson Memorial. Uh, and I was there to hear Martin Luther King uh, give his I Have a Dream speech. And that was, I was way back at the back of the crowd, but I could see everything. And then, uh, Later on the 40th anniversary, I was, and I was involved in a PTA, a national PTA, and was in uh, DC. And on the 40th anniversary of Dr. King's speech, um, we went that night up to the, Lincoln, to the Jefferson um, Memorial. And well, actually, it's coming from the Lincoln Memorial, it's at the other end. And they were doing a broadcast that night. And we got to watch um, them do that and talk about and, and stand on the place where Martin Luther King stood. Then I was involved with the Department of uh, Health and Human Services. I was a regional uh, attorney for a five-state region in Dallas. And part of the thing I did, and uh, this was in a, a time of change after the Civil Rights Act, um, and then after the Supreme Court finally told school districts they had to desegregate, I was involved as a regional counsel uh, with the Department of Justice and the Office for Civil Rights in going around the region, and particularly in Texas, and working with the school districts to finally desegregate. Um, and two of the experiences that were interesting out of that, one was I had a congressman from Houston, a young congressman named George Bush, uh, who called, and I had known him, work with him on some other things, and he called and he said, John, I just want to know one thing. Um, are you going, to, are we going to be reasonable in working with, with the school district? Uh, you know, I understand what you have to do, but you know, I said, absolutely. The other thing um, was in, working with, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, it skipped my mind. I'll get back to it in a minute. Um, oh, well, yeah, the other was going back to my school district, which was right outside of Houston, and talking to the superintendent about desegregating the school. And there was a black neighborhood right across from there, um, and they were separated by a pasture uh, along the way and a, a barbed wire fence. And we talked with him, and he just happened to be my old high school football coach. So that was kind of interesting. Um, and also started working on, uh, at that time, when Title IX was very new, and working with uh, colleges on that. So that's, that's been something that's been part of my life for a long time. And um, so coming to, coming to Bellevue and from Dallas, which, you know, has a lot of different races, a lot of, uh, but still at that time, uh, very segregated in a lot of ways. And coming to Bellevue and coming to this area, uh, and particularly over the last several years, seeing the dramatic change and seeing the, the, the diversity we have has just been amazing. And I'm, I'm very, very excited and proud to be part of that and realizing that um, 
in, in ways I bring a diversity to what is a different way, in a sense. Um, you know, our council, and so when three years ago we had a, it's going four now, the, day, the years go by quickly, but we had a council retreat and we came up with, and we hadn't really looked at this in a number of years, a new council vision uh, and uh, priorities and, and where we wanted to go. And it starts with the simple phrase, Bellevue welcomes the world. Our diversity is our strength. And I always say I mean it. And really through events like this, you can see that we mean it. Tonight's event is one of several we've hosted recently, and just wanted to remind you, this is, you know, we have a lot of things going on. The Exploring Cross-Cultural co Communications in April. Uh, we've had neighborhood leadership gatherings on the changing face of Bellevue. Uh, MLK uh, Day uh, discussions at City Hall featuring Dr. Robert D'Angelo, and two years ago, um, we had uh, uh, Dr. Robinson, uh, who, uh, Dr. Roberts, uh, who was one of the uh, Little Rock Seven. And so we've, we've done a lot in, in having these kind of events. So uh, this is a big part of that. And I really, really appreciate the positive response we've gotten from the community, from neighbors. When we started talking about our diversity is our strength, you kind of wondered, okay, what's the reaction gonna be with the public? I have to tell you, it's been very positive. Very, very positive. I did happen to run across um, an older woman that I uh, worked with in, in some uh, city stuff who was um, a little concerned about, had just come to a cultural conversations meeting and, and we were talking outside and she said, you know, John, I just, I'm having trouble with this. Um, particularly the idea that Bellevue is no longer a majority minority, a majority white uh, community. And she said, I just, I'm having trouble with it. She said, it's just not right. And I said, well, you know, it's one of those hard conversations. You don't want to argue or anything. But I said, you know, I understand. But things are changing, and, and there's a lot of positive to it. And we had a little conversation. But that's really the only time I've really had come, somebody come up and say something, which I think is amazing, given a lot of the conversations in the country now and in this area. Um, so again, I think it's a testimony to the community we have here and people who are very committed to living in a beautiful place and a beautiful culture that celebrates life and celebrates all human beings. Uh, we know that our diversity is an advantage. And I think that's, that was a, a different mindset to say, diversity is not something we have to work through. Diversity is something that helps us work through issues, helps us work through the community. And it's, it's a definite advantage. And it's actually one of the many reasons that Bellevue is consistently ranked as one of the best cities to live in the country. And hearing perspectives from those whose upbringing, education, and life experiences are different from our own enriches the conversation. It definitely makes us stronger. And reaping the advantage of our diversity doesn't just happen by accident. And that's why you're here tonight. As a public official, I know that it takes a lot to get people together regarding a common cause and the importance of including those who may have a different cultural background. Uh, and diversity is a lot of things. It's different neighborhoods. It's a lot of where you came from and all those other factors. But uh, we have so many different cultures here, and we're all part of that community. And it's important we continue to break down our silos. We continue to need uh, to have a positive discussion and where we strive to foster a community culture that we all want to live in. And it's not a spectator sport. It's not just people talking to each other or just listening to somebody talk. Um, you have to be involved and be personally involved in it. And I think all of you here are in that framework. So as you experience tonight's discussion, I want you to think about the themes and reflect on ways you can help inspire others. Um, We've all had our paths in life and we all have our different stories and I've told you a little bit of mine and I think we can look back on part of our lives and some things we probably want to forget but there are a lot of things that we are very proud of and I think for, I feel it from the crowd that diversity and being part of a larger uh, community and part of the world is important to you and I think that is something that just typifies uh, that 
Bellevue welcomes the world, our diversity is our strength. So again, welcome, please enjoy tonight's program and come back often, thank you. And, and the Under Our Skin project, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Lee, who uh, has joined us this evening as well. So thank you, <laughs> Councilmember Lee, for joining us. So a few years ago, the Seattle Times recognized that race was a dominant subject matter in their headlines, and they thought about what could we really do to do differently to be able to move this forward, move the conversation forward. So the Seattle Times decided to examine words and phrases that they noticed people were using and interpreting, sometimes very differently. Then they invited 18 people who represent a mix of backgrounds and perspectives to be able to talk about what those expressions mean to them. And it's those videos that we'll use to be as the catalyst for our conversations to be able to share with each other today. So I'm really looking forward to that part. This is something that I haven't necessarily been part of, kind of a free flow conversation on race based on these videos. So um, I think we have an opportunity to really kind of set the standard around how we want to be able to do this in our own community, which doesn't necessarily mean, right, it's going to be easy or comfortable or, you know, we will wor work very hard to make it safe for everyone because we value everyone's opinions here and perspectives here as well. But it's the practice. And I think we're going to dive in and practice. So I'd like to turn it over to Joe, who's going to talk a little bit more about what we have planned for this evening. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joe Anderson Cavinta. And I'm part of a group called the Eastside Race and Leadership Coalition, as with Mark and Tizita. And I also work as the Diversity Services Coordinator for the King County Library System. And so, you know, Mark, who you met, and Tizita, who you will meet, we're here as your guides today. We're here to create the space in order for us to have these conversations. And so we all come here today basically as strangers, right? You may look across the room, there may be some folks you know, but there's probably a lot of folks you don't know. So let's have a conversation about race, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so we all come with these various experiences and as your guide, we'll be there for you. But really, folks here may have never had a conversation about race before tonight or very casually have. And some folks in the room may teach the subject on a college level. And then there's the rest of us who fall somewhere in that spectrum, where it's part of our daily lives, part of our daily conversations, or we don't think about it at all. And so I wanted to bring up the image behind me. You might be wondering why there's an image of, there's about 15 people on a canoe. Well, one good reason to bring it up is to always remind ourselves, first of all, that we are on indigenous land and partially to pay homage to the folks and the heritage of our region. That's one very good reason. <laughs> the other reason is I wanted to utilize the canoe and folks on the canoe, which is all of us as our metaphor for setting the stage for the experience this evening, okay? How many here have actually been on a canoe before? Wow. <laughs> okay, and so it is the Northwest, thank you. <laughs> um, to, to be on a canoe, right, and to make sure you don't end up in the water or run aground, there are certain skills you need, right? I'm looking to all of you. What kind of skills do you need to make sure everybody is safe? Tell me. Yes. Balance, yes. These things, it is really easy to tip over in one of these things. As is, it's really easy for our conversations to end up with us in the water and all wet, right? And so when we think about balance, we want to think about when we are in our groups, when we're having these discussions, we want to think about each other, you know, and how we can have these conversations. Everybody has something to contribute. Everybody has something of value to say. And we want to make sure that everybody in the room can participate. What is something else you need? Yes. 
teamwork. Yes, we are in it together. We chose today to get on board, right? We're all here. We're coming from a place of good intention, of wanting to learn. And so consider yourself a team. You know, if, if one person is having difficulty, we're all there to support you. What else do you need? Direction. We need a sense of direction. We need a purpose. And I want to tell you tonight we are not going to resolve institutional racism. We, we just can't, right? We are going to walk away probably with more questions, more ideas floating in our head than when we first came here. And that's great because our shared purpose for today is to get that greater level of understanding than before we entered the room today and to create these connections with people through stories. That's what I love about this program. The program is really about you. We could do this program a hundred times with the same videos and the same people and come out with different outcomes. But if we can help each other advance and understand these concepts a little bit better, then we've done our job. What else? Anything else you can think of? Yes. Yes. Commitment, because it doesn't end here tonight. What is great about the model that we're using that the Seattle Times has developed is you can use this outside of this evening. You can go back and watch some of the videos that we didn't watch. You can share it with your friends and family to continue this conversation because we want to give you the tools and the language to be able to further the conversation outside of this evening. One thing that folks didn't mention that I want to is trust. <laughs> we have to trust each other. We have to trust this process. We have to know that we're coming from a good place and we have to be able to love each other enough to say, you know what, what you said offended me. Or, and this is why, or, you know, I take ownership for, for, for something I said that I see has, you know, had a different impact on you. And so all of these things, all of these things will keep us afloat tonight, okay? Um, so what are we going to be doing? So uh, Mark described uh, the project a bit. It's a series of video segments based around concepts, anything from colorblindness to institutional racism to microaggressions to ally. Those four that I mentioned are the ones we're actually going to explore this evening. So um, we're going to spend some time together as a large group, listen to the introduction about what the project is about, hear some of the voices that we'll be hearing that are represented in the videos, and also spend some time in the room watching one of the videos, having discussion before we move into our breakouts, okay? And so before we do that, I want to introduce my colleague, Tizita Asefa, who will go over some of our conversational guidelines. Thank you, Jill. I wanna just take a moment to look at all of you and maybe you could take a moment to look around at one another. and I wanna give gratitude for all of you being here today. Um, my name is Tizita Asafa. Um, I have a background in multimedia education and I do that because I believe everybody should have access to education no matter their uh, poverty level, wealth level, um, background, race, gender, uh, religion, et cetera. And this is one of the ways that I get to use um, my work, this has been my life's work and I'm so grateful to work with uh, City of Bellevue and um, uh, the library systems uh, to present this. Uh, when we talk about common ground with conversations like these that could be really difficult, we came up with some uh, common thoughts that we felt everybody could agree on. You may want to add to these, but one of them is to respect one another. So respect one another's thoughts, respect yourself as well. Um, there may be times that you don't want to speak up. You'll have post-it notes at your table. If you feel like I'd rather write this down than say something right now, um, that's also available to you. To be present. So just like Manuel, uh, Mark was saying, um, not to have your brain thinking about how am I gonna rebut this, whatever this person's saying, but really listen, be present. And that's also what practicing active listening is, 
to shut down that part of the brain that says, I have to judge this, or um, it's good or bad, or I, I disagree. Um, and even if you do, you're still giving that person enough respect to listen and really hear. Um, this kind of work is uncomfortable, as it should be. So enjoy the discomfort. Shake it out. It might swim somewhere in your body. And a lot of us who experience these things, which is probably everybody in this room in some shape or form, you're probably carrying some of this in your body. So this is an opportunity to verbalize it, um, to write about it, um, to share afterwards. And then hopefully, as you walk out, definitely shake it out. <laughs> um, and take risks. It's a risky thing to say, I feel or I see. It's also a risky thing to be wide open and listen to somebody else's perspective that you may not agree with. But it's so much more worth it. And then speak from your experience. And this also goes with the I statements. So you might have experienced something uh, through somebody else's lens, but please use I statements rather than, and so and so feels like, and so and so, you know, you, we can only represent ourselves. And I think that that will uh, bring us to our, uh, our most honest uh, responses. Um, I want to ask if anybody has anything else to add to these. Is there anything missing in here? I, do, I did just think of one. Um, there is a saying called step up and step back. Is everybody familiar with that? So step up, if you're a quiet person, challenge yourself, right? This is the risk that you're going to take. And step back, if you're somebody who likes to talk a lot who <laughs> or has a lot of opinions, which is really awesome, but step back so that those people who are afraid to step up have a space. Um, and like we said, we're going to try our best to create safe spaces, but it takes all of us to create those safe spaces. And that safe space means that we're willing to take these risks together and grow together. And uh, like Joe and Mark have said, our hope is that once you leave here, you will continue these conversations. Play the videos over and over and over again, either for yourselves. I watched some of them while I was getting ready to come here. And I said, I've facilitated these kinds of things so many times. Why am I still so tense? It's because these times are really tense. And I, I think these times have always been tense. So it's not just these times, it's not just today, right? We can all attest to that. We've seen so much violence. We've seen so many things happening that are atrocious in places that are supposed to be safe, right? Right here in Washington, just recently in Oregon. So I hope that we're all willing to come together and have these conversations so that it doesn't have to be lash out moments or that people don't have to bottle up things and feel that um, anger or violence is the appropriate manner uh, in which to have discourse. It is our world. And all these things happen because we do it to one another. They don't just happen. So. I thank all of you for being here. And um, I say that really humbly. Um, and I hope uh, to hear some lively discussions um, throughout the evening. And I look forward to hearing more uh, in terms of what happens um, in your lives and in your communities and your workspaces. Thank you.
Okay, so the first thing we're going to do as a group is queue up uh, the introduction piece, which is a small, uh, I mean short uh, segment. It's just a minute and a half introducing the project. And then we're going to get right into color blindness, which is one of the segments that uh, we're going to show followed by some discussion. So we will begin now. See, I was supposed to have this liberal image and it's not. Sometimes I feel like it's 1954. People feel really empowered just to say it out loud and just announce their ignorance. Seattle is, is gentle. You're not necessarily going to encounter extreme hostility. You're going to encounter many layers of subtlety. What that also means is that it's under your skin annoying. If you're talking about race and you're not uncomfortable, you're probably not having the right conversation. There's tension attached to this conversation. It's unfortunate that we consider it difficult conversations to have. We throw out the word race or racism and people, uh, I think, uh, hear that in so many different ways. I think a lot of people are scared to be called a racist or of using or exploiting their white privilege or causing a microaggression or whatever it is. All of these terms just contribute to an oversimplification. We'll often just give them their own meaning, kind of make them just buzzwords. A lot of these terms are constantly used but never really unpacked and people are interpreting them in quite different ways than the people who are, are speaking them. So like maybe we do take a tiny bit of time to define what we mean. I think it's funny when people say that like, I'm colorblind, I don't see color. Like, of course you see color. Colorblindness to me means like denying the fact that racism exists and racism still impacts us. I believe that all people are wonderfully and fearfully made and and um, diversity is a part of God's creation. If it's kind of a, well, we need to stop, you know, stereotyping based on different colors. If that's colorblindness, okay, I can see what they're saying there. But I think if we're gonna talk like true colorblindness, I don't, I think that does a disservice because we're, we're ignoring major parts of people's, people's lives. I think there's a richness in our diversity. And I think colorblindness kind of tries to erase that. And it's also a jump to denial. Uh, it's a way to put the conversation uh, at rest. It's become a bad word. There was a time when it was the goal. I think that's a good word, you know. I think that's a good word when we reach that point of colorblindness. And you don't see race, you see a person. Yes, it's a great idea. Like, it's a great goal, it's a great vision to have of like, let's be in a world where we don't have to worry about differences and to truly value each other for just our character, for just our personality, for just our experiences, would be a great thing. Um, I'd love to see that one day. But the reality is we're, you know, in a world that does see difference. I think a lot of people were raised to not, to not take color, um, as the main thing about a person. It's really jarring, I think, to, and very hard to understand why somebody would want to have everyone pay attention to what color they are. Um, when you've worked your whole life to try to make sure that people are treated equally, regardless of color. There are a lot of white people who are indeed colorblind because they were taught by black people to be, <laughs> that this is a good thing, and so it, they don't realize that, well, no, you were taught by one segment of the black political world to be. There are other segments that believe quite different things. It's an older solution, <laughs> right? It's an older solution that has become a problem. Being colorblind essentially means that we're trying to homogenize everyone that we see. So it might be a noble, noble effort in some cases, but homogenization of any culture inevitably has us slowly drifting towards being the white ideal. Like if you're saying, oh, I don't see you as black, I just see you as Jarrell. Like, nah, bro, I want you to see me as black. Like, that's why I got dreadlocks. That's why, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's why I talk like this. Why, that's why I wear my Africa gear, you know? Like, I'm proud to be what I am, and people that say they're colorblind or say that they don't see that, um, I think that that speaks more to their internal struggle than it does to the external. It's almost as if it comes from a place of discomfort and, you know, as if I don't want to hear about race and as if it's a problem that we have different races and we have different 
backgrounds. Even if for some reason you were completely colorblind, it wouldn't matter because the schools see color, the jails see color. Like with systemic racism, you don't even have to see color because the systems we've made will see color for you. I don't think anybody can truly be colorblind. I don't think being colorblind as a person actually exists. If you just meet me, I think you know you better not come out your mouth and say, I don't see color. Unless you're in this just utopia of race doesn't exist anymore and we're just all one. I always like to refer to it as like the movie Avatar. We're just gonna be blue. It's self-defeating. Like, I'm colorblind. I don't see the fact that we're all different. You, you just said that we're all different. Kids see different colors of skin. Babies see it. I can tell when I meet a baby that has not seen a black person before. Because they're like, oh, it's just this reaction. It's super weird. Overall, sure, it doesn't matter what race someone is, but do we see it? Absolutely. And it's beautiful. It's really cool. I have no idea what I'd rather have, have the term be rather than colorblind, but color thoughtful? Color-minded? I have no idea. Colorblindness doesn't stop to think about accommodations that might need to be made for races. I used to struggle a lot with this notion of why you need to treat people differently, like why? If we're all equal, you shouldn't have to treat anybody differently. But now I've come around to the other side, whereas realizing that if the environment you're in is fundamentally biased, you do need to treat people differently, like you just do. I think you can be a person that says, I'm colorblind, because I treat everyone equally regardless of their skin color and still be completely, you know, and still understand that people have different experiences um, or cultures or whatever. It's a false premise. Everybody's conscious of color. They just don't understand it. So like Mark said at the beginning, we're going to practice. And so we just heard the segment on colorblindness and the question is posed is what does colorblindness mean to you? And so this is your opportunity to share with somebody what this word has meant to you, whether you've heard it in different context, whether you use it in some regard, whether it's something that um, angers you or something that you feel is uh, a part of your vernacular, please find someone next to you even better, extra points, someone you don't know. But please partner up, and if you don't have a partner near you, please raise your hand so you can find somebody. And just spend a few moments talking about what does colorblindness mean to you?